Gallaudet University presents. Welcome to our VL2 lecture series. This is the last one for this semester. We've had a variety of speakers, all kinds of speakers this semester. And today, we have saved the best for last to wrap up the semester. We have a real treat for you today. Talia Krakowski. I probably spelled that wrong. Uh, as you know, VL2 is funded by the National Science Foundation. A lot of the work that we do is inside of a lab where we study brain development, linguistics, language development. So it's very important for us to understand visual processes in language and the learning that happens as part of language development. We know that on campus, there are other groups of people that are focusing on the understanding of deaf space. How do deaf people live in the world that is completely visually based? We know that what we're studying in the research lab is very important for what happens out in the world. How do students learn through visual engagement? And how should our world be set for visual learners in terms of how visual people navigate their space through the world? how they interact with other people. And so today's lecture sort of brings the best of both, if you will. We are very excited about today's topic to have Talia talk with us today and have her here with us as we think about the future of VL2 and where we want to go with our research agenda and the work that we're doing. It's important that we think more and more about translating this research into ideas of visual space and visual engagement and how to make the best of that. So please, as you're listening, asking questions, uh, I'm sure that you will learn a lot from today's lecture. So uh, I need to just tell you a little bit in terms of introduction from the announcement that went out. So I'm going to read this and have Jen sign it. <laughs> okay. um, Tali is the founder of uh, um, Apolog, Apolog Incorporated, and which is dedicated to the creation of immersive environments that seamlessly integrate new media, storytelling, and physical space. Committed to highly multidisciplinary and collaborative methodology, um, Tali has imagined and created interactive spaces for clients such as Chanel, Victoria's Secret, BMW, the Museum of Modern Art, IBM, Frank Gehry, HBO, and Van Cleef and um, Arpels. Uh, she's a frequent speaker and writer on topics of design, technology and architecture, and is also a curator and moderator of global cross-disciplinary events that focus on facilitating conversations amongst professionals around the science and fiction of immersive design. So I think you can see that uh, we're in for a treat, and we really welcome you to our campus Thank you. and to our stage. Tell Thank us. you. Um, so. It's such a treat for me to be here, and I have to tell you that I've never done anything like this before. So, um, 
I spent the day with the amazing team here and it kind of changed the way I, I um, was going to present. So I've changed things around, which means it's a lecture I've never really given before. But So I think it's between 45 minutes and an hour, but we're just going to go with it. Um, and I want to invite you to contribute or comment or ask questions throughout. I, no need to wait until the end. Um, so I wanted to start with love, um, with the book on, uh, called On Love by Alain de Botton. And this is an amazing book written in fast passing by this perfectly uh, ordinary man who falls in love with this perfectly ordinary woman. And apart from the fact that it's a spectacular book, and if you write one thing down in the next hour, I wish it would be this book, um, he makes uh, one of the lines in the book is a special something that really resonated with me. And he says that he leaves classically beautiful women to men without an imagination. His Im imagination enjoyed playing in the space between Chloe's teeth, Chloe being the woman he's in love with. I was like, that's so poetic. But what is it about this line about him leaving beautiful women to men without an imagination? And what does it mean that his imagination lived in the space between her gap teeth? And I realized that actually, in a kind of poetic way, it's exactly what I do and what I live for, which is bringing the imagination through the digital into the physical world and filling those spaces um, that are entirely physical, the spaces that we inhabit with uh, interactivity and digital media. I'll, I'll show you what I mean. But I want to start with, um, I did my graduate thesis in interactive architecture. And since this is an academic institution, I imagine that you can share love for books. So this book totally changed the way I thought about design. Um, Rainer Banham, Architectural Theory. Oh, sorry. Architectural theory, so you can imagine how it would be super boring, but in fact, it's a thrilling book. And it's called The Architecture of the Well-Tempered Environment, written in 1969. In 1969, he wrote this book, which became entirely revolutionary. I promise this is the only piece of history I'm going to show you. But what he said was that up until that point, there would be architects, right? So people who were dealing with design, and then engineers who would be dealing with the structural considerations. And his radical idea was that we have to integrate mechanical processes with design, something that today is fairly obvious to us. Why it was a fascinating um, piece of literature for me is because the entire project um, my lifelong project um, and what I do on a daily basis is based on the idea that the 21st century is going to be about spaces that integrate digital media with physical architecture. So taking the same concept of seamlessly integrating mechanical with design and thinking about digital and design. And the conceptual model looks something like this. So it's something seemingly uh, futuristic and abstract, but actually um, what I'm talking about is create, sorry, I'm getting in trouble here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, is about creating intelligent spaces that have digital intelligence, but also the ability to physically transform and become different things to different people at different times. 
So just like the Transformers can come and be tough and kick ass and save the good guys, they can also become a car and help them to transport them. And this all came from um, a love that I have for conversations. And I love conversations, and I think this applies to verbal or, or sign conversations. I love conversations because to me, they're the stuff of life. They're the moments that we learn, we emote, we entertain. And um, when I think about what breaking down what a conversation is, and it'll be interesting for me to get your feedback and how this maps into your world, but in general, I think about it in terms of content, which is the story, interface, which is me in this case, and then uh, space, which is the space that I was around us. And those three components influence the conversation. In fact, they completely shape the conversation. So then thinking about the content, when I think about storytelling, then all storytelling is are pieces of data that are woven together. And whether that weaving is something that is linear or nonlinear can change. And we, I'll show you and, and would love to talk to you about that. Sorry, you put your hand up before. Um, blue and white check it. No? OK. Um, so then the kind of spaces that I'm talking about are conversation spaces. So if we break down what a conversation is, and this isn't a good example because I'm just talking, so it's not a conversation, but the idea is that I say something, I output a piece of data, you capture that data, you process that data, you save that data, and then you respond with something new that is affected by what I said. So it's a kind of a feedback loop. Now that is all very intuitive for us, but what if our spaces had agency? In other words, what happens if we could have that same feedback loop, not just with each other, but with the physical world that we live in, the architecture that we're in? And what fascinates me the most is that we are living, organic beings. And we can transition from one mood to another in a moment. We can even have multiple simultaneous moods. Do you know what I mean? How you could be happy about something and super pissed off about something else at the same time. And at, at the same time, our spaces are entirely analog. They have no intelligence. They have very little ability to adapt. So what if our spaces could really transform and interact with us in real time? Essentially, what we're talking about is a behavior of space. So before I get into all the fun visual stuff, I just want to break down um, three categories of behavior uh, in, of in behavior in design in space. The first one is what I call prescribed. And prescribed is essentially a story that's already been written. A movie is a great example, right? We go see a movie, no matter who's in the theater, we're never going to change the story. It just unfolds. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, I wanted to share with you um, in this introduction a few examples of projects that really inspire me. Um, this one is from the uh, Sh China Pavilion at the Shanghai Expo in 2010. Um, what it is is they took one of their ancient tapestries 
and they built it on an architectural scale, and they literally animated every boat and literal person in this tapestry. I'll play it and you can see. so the video is alive. Really beautiful and interesting, but again, this is not a smart space. So then, my second category of behavior in a space is what I call responsive. Responsive means, for me, a space that is aware of its surroundings, but cannot engage in a traditional conversation. In other words, it is responding to outside variables, but I can't go and press a button to change it. This project, which I love, um, is a project by uh, a mediotis called Zach Lieberman, and it is a building that was transformed into a light performance based on music that was playing in real time. So the idea is to translate the sound, the beat of the sound, and create a living painting at the scale of architecture, which is pretty exciting and interesting to me. Um, another ex example, and this is an artist called Raphael Lozano Hammer, who is my god. Um, and he, he did, I have two projects of his to show you that I thought might be particularly meaningful in this context. One is a project he did in London called <coughs> Underscan, in which he took a public space uh, at night and he flooded it with light just like this. Um, and what happened was that when you stood there, the shadow that you would cast would activate a video of a person looking at you. And the longer you lingered, the longer, the more the person who's buried in the ground would interact with you. And then when it sensed that you were moving away, the character too would turn away and, and disappear. So a kind of responsive space that's engaging in conversation with you, which I just think is so poetic and magnificent. Or this project, which is called Pulse Perk, also done by Raphael Zeno um, It was in New York City, and it's a perk that he set up with a field of lights, and then he put these sensors all across the perk. And you would come and put your hand on the sensors, and it would capture your heartbeat and translate it into a light performance, which I just think is so lovely to, to translate the thing that you, that makes us alive into an art piece and, and really help transform it. And then the third and final category, which to me is the most exciting uh, from a future perspective, which is the interactive. And this is a space that has real agency. And when I say space, I use space in a very loose sense. So a space can be a permanent space or a temporary space. It can be a piece of architecture or an object that surrounds us. Um, in fact, in this example, uh, this, is this is a vest that's created for the blind. And what it does is it has a GPS system 
embedded in it. And um, so, so the blind can program where they want to go. The vest knows where they're located. And using physical vibration, it actually takes them to the right place, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, these examples of how technology is used not for the sake of doing something cutesy, but for the sake of doing something artful, or functional, or meaningful is really what drives me. So I brought for you um, several case studies of projects that we've done. Um, not to say by any means that we've gotten to interactive architecture, although I hope to someday come here and tell you all about that. But I picked these projects because I think they begin to touch upon some things that could take us to places of real interaction. Um, so this one is called Bloom. And it was for a museum in LA, just opened recently. It's a cultural institution uh, celebrating Mexicans, uh, Mexican Americans and Mexicans. And um, I don't know if you know this, but in LA, the majority of the population is Mexican. So this is a really relevant conversation. So this is the, the building, and it's framed with palm trees, as you would expect any good LA building to be. And we came in fairly late in the process. Um, the architects had already designed a fence surrounding the museum and designed these massive screens that's seven feet high and four feet wide. Um, so in this, in this case, we didn't get to design the interface or the architecture, but purely the content, the storytelling. But what was tricky was that they had invited us to design the content for these screens, and the intention was that we would create these stories that would tease out certain aspects of the museum and, in, and kind of seduce people to come into the museum. Except that they didn't have an archive because it was a new institution. So how do you create storytelling that will be on 12 hours a day, seven days a week, that's constantly changing without a single story? So the first thing we proposed um, was a visual concept. But before I go there, I just want to frame it with um, concep a conceptual metaphor uh, to introduce the idea. Um, so I have this, I have a girlfriend in LA who's super hot. She works for Google. She did a PhD in artificial intelligence, like this amazing lady, and she loves to tango. So she convinces me to go to a tango class, which ended up being a big mistake for me, except for this one revelation. Um, so tango, we've all seen the tango being danced. Whether you've ever danced the tango by yourself or not, when someone is dancing the tango, you know it. That's not particularly interesting until you start to learn about the tango and discover that actually the, the tango is made up of a spectrum of steps from simple to me, me, medium to advanced. Um, and what happens is that the man, of course the man, because who else would lead, the man uh, dances the tango and he listens to the music and he picks Certain, I just realized that I can't convey sarcasm through you. So you're gonna have, cannot, so you're gonna have to do your best. So when I talk about men like that, I mean it in a sarcastic way, so you know. Um, so, so, when, so then when a man is leading, he basically listens to the music and he has a catalog of, of steps that he knows and he can pick between any step and just play it out. That's interesting because how could it be that any two individuals at 
any given moment can dance a tango that has virtually no rules and still maintain the inherent sense of the tango. And then I realized that essentially what it is is a kind of act of co-authorship. I'll explain. The designer of the tango came up with a style, a logic, for how people move in general. But each time someone dances the tango, they interpret and weave a different, a different idea into it. And so in a sense, it isn't just the tango designer that is creating the tango, nor is it just us dancing the tango, but a kind of real-time co-authorship. So how do you translate that into nonlinear storytelling? Well, in this case, I had just come back from Mexico. Um, I have a friend there who got married. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to a Mexican wedding, but we're talking about 600 people uh, dancing until 7 in the morning and tequila all night. It is not an easy event to get through. Deeply inspiring. And one of, so I came back and we got this project and what we pitched to them was the idea of wrapping all these screens in a, in a forest, in a blooming forest. Um, and that the forest would be made out of all the indigenous flowers and fauna and butterflies and birds that, and tapestry that make Mexico, so you could see that in the detail. But, and we wanted it to feel nostalgic, but at the same time contemporary. But what we also wanted it is it to be alive. So that it, because the thing about this forest is that it's ever changing. So what we proposed was to transform an illustration that we did for this project into an ever blooming forest. So here's how we did it. We broke each component. Does this make sense so far? You, you have to feel free to interrupt me if it doesn't. Um, we broke each part of the forest into um, an element. And then we took the smallest element of that design, in this case, just a single leaf. And we developed a series of parameters within which that leaf can grow, just like the tango, so that every time this plant grows, the sword fawn, it will grow slightly differently. And we did that for each part of the forest. So each one of those had its own inner logic, and it would never paint itself the same way. And by the way, you know, there's a story to each one of those. So for example, this is the monarch butterfly, and we used it because um, the monarch butterfly in Mexican culture is a symbol of migration, something that is so deeply inherent to Mexican culture, particularly in the US. Okay, so then we worked with some super amazing developers, yes sir, in the blue and white. So you're saying that they all move and grow on their own. What activates them to move and grow? Good. I'm glad you asked me because I'm about to share you right here. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, no. Thank you for your question. So this, my friends, is our forest. We had a developer, the team of developers, write a piece of software in Adobe Air, if that means anything to any of you, which essentially allows us to, each node in that interface is one of those graphic elements that I showed you. And then each time you click on one of those nodes, 
you can enter the behavioral parameters of that node. And then, we, so each, each plant, each flower has the parameters of how it behaves, and it also has a general path, a general vector in which it moves. And that, in a way, is how we create some kind of, we allow it to unfold in real time, and it's ever changing, but we make sure that there is design intent and that it always looks good. So I'll show you now uh, one rendering of an instantiation. Ah, uh, Stripe Shop. So how is it that you came, uh, you made it come to life? Use a projector, is a flat screen, or what is it that, that makes it uh, move? Because we're talking about like it being on a frozen board. So how is it that it interacts? Okay, I'm gonna answer this question in two ways. My next slide shows how it moves, and then in a few slides, I'll show you the hardware on which it actually photographs of the site. And then if you still have that question, come back to me. And of course, every time this would be different. So you'd never see the same thing. And then the logic for the storytelling is that the forest would appear, would grow on and off the screen to, do, to reveal these stories. But these stories, too, have a story. Don't read what's on there. Listen to me. So the, the, I'm sharing this to you because our client had, um, didn't have a collection. So there was no point in looking at an archive to decide what stories we're going to tell. Instead, what we did with them is we ask them what type of stories they want to tell. And what came out of this strategic exploration was that we identified different types of stories. And then we designed a series of templates that would support different types of stories. So one type of story might be about the institution, and another type of story might be Mexico and the news without saying what the story is. It's just a different type of storytelling. So we designed eight templates. Each template is um, coded. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So just to establish the language, um, we collected images, videos, and text from the museum. And each object, each object, I'm gonna call an asset. Good luck to you with that. <laughs> so, okay, you got, so each asset sits in the cloud, right, in the virtual world, but each asset is a smart asset. So every image knows its relationship to other pieces of text and other images. So what happens in real time is this whole system runs by itself. We're not writing any stories. The system calls a template. It grabs a template from the database. That template knows that it can only tell specific types of storytelling. So in this case, education. The template knows that it needs an image and a heading, so it grabs the image and the affiliated heading. And then it generates, in real time, all by itself, a show. So an example, this is a very simple template with just a big image 
and an image caption. And just by writing this code, we can create different types of shows. So the system can show a cultural, an institution related story, or a community based story, or a historical based story or a sponsorship-based story. And I'll just take you through a few slides just to give you some examples. And then we added one more layer because we wanted this we weren't allowed to add interaction because our client didn't want it, but what we wanted to do was make it smud. So we embedded motion sensors. And what happens is you can't see the motion sensors, but if you linger in front of the screen for more than a few seconds, it can tell you additional storytelling about that topic because it recognizes the fact that you're intrigued. So then to answer your question about where did this all live, um, we had a, we started digging the foundations to build the, hard, the hardware because it was these massive screens. Um, and all of a sudden they found in one week 113 bodies in the ground, which was <laughs> dramatic. And then what happened was that the um, Native Americans asked to, to stop the project to investigate where those bodies were because no one knew that there was, this was essentially a cemetery. And what was discovered was that the bodies were actually first generation Mexicans because adjacent to the museum um, is a church. And so we had to adapt our whole design to create a sacred space around uh, the cemetery and build around that. And when your architecture is stationary, it's not so simple to do. But it was, um, so we had one of the screens built on the inside um, and it's using uh, this technology that are basically tiles that are super high resolution and then these are the screens as they're going in on the outside with anti-graffiti so no one leaves them unwanted messages. And this is what it looked like at night, a kind of uh, glowing tapestry. And I'll just show you just a few of the final shows that were generated in real time. So you understand that basically we gave the museum a system that where all they need to do is every time there's a new show, put in new images and they can, and the whole system orchestrates itself. And we can even program it so the museum can say, screen three, play Cinco de Mayo content from this date to that date, or increase the frequency of storytelling around a specific exhibition from this date to that date. So um, I have two, two more projects. Uh, this project 
my favorite pug about this project didn't get built, so I thought I'd bring a show to you anyway. Um, and it was for a very inspiring client called Jose Cuervo. So we designed, um, they had a super cool idea, which was basically, instead of making commercials that tell you that you want to drink Jose Cuervo, that they would um, hijack a city block in different cities around the country and transform them into a Mexican festival and basically invite people to try their product so they can decide if they're interested or not. So um, we collaborated with a company out in Chicago called Digital Kitchen and an ad agency called Chris and Porter and developed a strategy for how we were going to do this. So basically, we shut off two sides of the street so we could ID people. And then, and then identify focal points where we want to draw people into and create experiences in those points that will draw people because there's nothing more fun than being surrounded by people. So we went back to the, Jose, to the Jose Cuervo bottle, which next time you have a tequila, have a look. There's a black raven on it. So we decided to explore that a little bit. and came up with this idea, which I wish they said yes to, which was a giant cage where the bar was the exterior of the cage, sorry, the interior circle of the cage. And the bartenders stood in the middle And then the exterior of the cage was wrapped in projections. And we would project ravens flying 360 around. And the movement of the ravens would be dictated by the activity of the people around the bow. So in a kind of responsive way, the architecture would be in conversation with the people, which is really how I want to be drinking my tequila. <laughs> and then, oh, yeah, yes, sir. Are they constantly in motion, or do they have? Do the birds ever sit at rest? Are the to be honest, I, we didn't even get that far, but that's a good question. I think what we would have done is um, have dictated, I think we would have always wanted to be, have them in motion to draw people towards them, but then they would change in scale and speed based on the activity. But this is just the beginning of an idea, which is really how we do our walk. We come up with these ideas and convince our clients to do them or not in this case. Yes, sir. So it could be like the more you sign, the more the birds fly, yes. right? So that would be one way yes. of dictating the birds' yes. motion. OK, so then our other idea was to have um, tequila fountain descend from the center of the cage and have a sculptural component so it would look like tequila frozen in space. And then there would be a tap so that the bartender stood in the middle and kind of, but they didn't want that idea either. So then we proposed, you guys know that the tequila is made from the agave plant. Um, well, now you know, it's an important thing. 
Uh, and so we proposed a giant 25 by 25 by 25 foot sculpture of a, an agave plant with interior projections that would also be affected by the way people interacted with it. And they liked that idea, but I'll show you what happened in the end. And then this is super cool, and they didn't buy this either, but one day I'm gonna build it and come here and show you, which was uh, the idea of an interactive canvas where you would be in Orlando at this installation painting on this canvas, and then I could be online painting with you in real time. So we would see each other and paint together simultaneously, essentially eliminating the boundaries of physical and virtual space, which is something that's really interesting to me, um, and also because, well, because of collaboration and because of how collaboration changes how we create. And you can see that all the projects that we do are, are fairly complex and require very elaborate collaborations, which when I'm done, if you're interested, uh, we could talk about that some more. Um, lights, everyone needs agave lights. And then um, what we proposed was in order not to affect the city street but transform it is to cover the windows with gels of different designs and turn the lights on so that they would light up and cast a shadow on the street and just create an event out of it. So they ended up picking the agave plant, but they didn't want rear projection. And then they suggested that we make it an inflatable structure. And we got a heart attack because of course it would look like a, like a clown hat gone wrong. <laughs> so instead we convinced them to spend four times as much and build a proper structure. Um, and just a few pictures of how this was constructed. They took away the projection, we used LED lights instead. But I wanted to share it with you because there's kind of a harsh reality to our imagination too, and this is it. But it was still cool. And what we did was the thorns on the agave plant, we substituted with LEDs that were t tightly embedded under the fabric so it would glow at night. And this is it. Okay, last project and then a few thoughts and then I'll be quiet. Um, Chanel. So this was a different kind of project. Um, Chanel was redoing its um, store in Soho in Manhattan and Karl Lagerfeld wanted to do a three-day event and it had to be big and shiny and bright and fabulous. And this is the store And this was the creative brief. So we were hired by an event company called KCD um, to work with them on developing the creative and building this thing. Um, so what we, so Karl Lagerfeld took pictures of classic New York facades and then he graffitied over them and that was the campaign of the season. So what he wanted was some kind of a big screen that would feature the photography and honor it as artwork so that it would be high resolution and beautifully framed. And that's fine, except that he also wanted it to be porous, to be translucent so that you could see through the store that he just spent a gazillion dollars on. So, what we proposed
was um, a gate of light that would be made out of LEDs and would be shaped like an L across the corner of the street. And there would be a section, a tw two 23 foot wide sections of super high res LEDs, and then it would gradate out. So you could both resolve an image and still see through it. And then we collaborated with a company called United Visual Artists out of London um, to create content for those screens. But again, same situation as La Plaza, we have three days, it's on 12 hours a day, we have eight photographs, how do you make it interesting? So um, what you, you, you United Visual Artists developed was um, eight transitions that deconstruct the image in real time. And then the system literally pulls an image, pulls a transition, and composites them together in real time. So every time something looks different. So this is a previs. So this is the kind of tool that we'll use to explore a space that has not yet been built, but has a lot of different variables in it, and also be able to communicate that space to our clients before they get built. And um, I have a few slides that show the construction of it that I'm just gonna play through. So that was one part of the project. But then the brief um, came back to us because the Karl Lagerfeld wanted to have an opening night where he invites all his 700 of his fabulous friends. And so the question was, what kind of activity, what would happen during this event? And so we went back to the creative brief and looked at the floor plan and realized that essentially we have almost uh, an, like an enclosed red carpet in the space between the gate of light and the facade of the building, right here. So what we proposed was interactive graffiti. So, uh, going back to the brief, remember with the graffiti on the photograph. So we took, we worked with a company called Tangible Interactions that are amazing coding guys and bought uh, actual graffiti cans and converted them so that when you click on the nozzle, instead of emitting paint, they emit infrared light. And then we Chanelified the cans uh, with black sexy logo 
so all of them got stolen. And then we got, we hired hot waiters. Um, how do you translate hot? No? No. <laughs> like that, like that. Hot waiters. And uh, they stood with um, black trays of the cans and we designed two 23 foot wide shiny black Chanel walls and invited people to graffiti over them. And uh, we wrote an app that allowed us to control the colors of uh, what was going on the screen so we could art direct it. Um, and also we can delete it when people wrote naughty things like Louis Vuitton. So, and if you want to geek out with me for a moment, um, this is the back of house. Um, so, over here is the back of the high res LEDs, 23 feet wide. And then here, you see the back of the LEDs, the back of the projection of the interactive graffiti, the projectors suspended from the ceiling, mirrors, because we only had three feet of space, and then an infrared camera that read the cans in real time. I'd like to take the question. I saw this before uh, the Zach Lieberman, that yeah. Zach Lieberman did. He developed the open framework yes. software. So was that done or made possible with that open framework yeah. software? Yeah. And what's with it? Oh. So it made they made that with the open framework yeah. software. So what's been really exciting for me is that, and this is how I differentiate 21st century designers from 21st century designers, and I see it consistently everywhere, is competition versus collaboration. And the fact that we see open source code and we collaborate with designers and programmers all the time. And it goes back to the idea of co-creation. I love working with people that teach me something new and take an idea and make it different. So then, but I said that I love technology, but I don't love technology to be exposed because I think it's about the experience, not the techie stuff. So we, this is under construction, but we built a box that hid all the hardware so that everything was kind of seamless. And uh, some slides. And just to talk about, we, we spent the day talking about intuitive interfaces and natural ways of communicating. And what was really thrilling for me as an observation from this installation was to see two things. One is that when you give someone a tool, 
that's just fun and entirely unthreatening, even grandmothers would stop to graffiti. And the second most interesting observation for me was how a canvas, when it's digital, becomes so easy to approach because you're not afraid of leaving a mark. And once those grandmothers understood that I could delete stuff from my iPhone, they would come up to me and say, can you just delete that? And so we'd just get rid of it and they could paint again. So it was a very safe place for children of all ages. So this is myself and our producer celebrating. Um, and I wanted to end on my grandmother. Um, my grandmother is a super cool lady. She is a Russian Jew, um, lives in Israel. She, her family escaped from the Holocaust. Um, my family migrated to Israel because of anti-Semitism. You know, she's seen some stuff in her life. So we're really close, and I know she really loves me. And so she, she says to me, you do all this interesting stuff, and it's all great and lovely, and I don't really know what you do, but don't you want, didn't you want to just be an engineer or an architect or a doctor? You know, something that we could put, I could explain to my friends and so that it would be clear how you're changing the world. And I brought, it was a really profound moment for me because it made me realize that I have to articulate to my grandmother in terms that my grandmother would understand without all this techie blah blah, what it is that I do and why. And so what I said to her and what I wanted to leave uh, you guys with today is that for myself, um, the way that we create change, I believe, more than anything, is by evoking empathy. And that when we can feel what someone else feels, we become much more sensitive to it. And what I think is special about art and design and the role that it plays in culture is that it evokes, it's able, if used responsibly, evoke empathy. And, and so there is definitely room for the art and design world to change things by, um, by evoking empathy. Um, and, I, and I end this with five thoughts about where I think the future is going, um, and welcome your thoughts about it. I'm gonna do this really quickly. Do you mind? Okay, tell me you don't mind. One is wearable computing. I think we're going to see more and more that uh, technology is leaving the boxes and integrating into our world. This is a solar bikini um, and done by a, an amazing student actually out of NYU called Andrew Schneider, I think, and if I have that wrong, just email me and I'll send you the link to his project. Solar Bikini captures the sun rays and transforms them to power our, our music players, which I think is super cool. Um, so that, that's a whole world, wearable computing, um, and if you're interested in it, I can guide you to some websites that I think you might find inspirational. The second is 3D printing. That blows my mind. I was, um, a few months ago, I was in San Francisco at an event that the CEO of Autodesk put on, and they were talking about creating 3D printers that will print everything. So, we're going to have printers in our houses that can print phones for us when we need phones, and all we'll need to do is pay for the code, download it, and have these objects printed in our houses, which is a phenomenal idea and changes trade, import, export, 
resources, manuf I mean, it changes the whole world. But if you want to think about, take it to the next step, Autodesk is actually developing 3D printers that print 3D printers. What? Yes. So to me, that you know, that's just we're gonna have to reimagine the whole world, not just our bikinis. The thought is kinetic thought, right? Yes. Thought is kinetic architecture, which is really what I started off with, spaces that are living. I can't show you great examples of them yet because we haven't built them yet. Um, but that's up to us to, to do. In the meantime, I can show you a super cool project by Rem Koolhaas, K-O-O-L-H-A-U-S. Um, he did a project for Prada um, and essentially designed a building that could rotate and each of its sides was programmed for something different. So one was for a store, and one was for a fashion show, and one was for a cultural event, and so it goes. Which is just a, a really radical and fascinating idea. The fourth thing that I'm obsessed with is the deconstruction of screens. We need to reimagine content, we need to reimagine architecture. We also have to stop thinking that a screen has to be 2D and rectangular. There's no reason for it. This is a project out of the MIT Media Lab where they've created little helicopter LEDs that are programmable so they can paint sculpturally in 3D, which is exciting. Sorry. And then um, the last thing is uh, the Internet of Things. Don't know if you have part of it. If you haven't, I really recommend you Google it. Um, it's a whole movement that's based on the idea that each of our objects is going to have intelligence um, and that our objects are going to be speaking to each other. This already exists in many ways. Um, in certain parts of the world and in the country, there's actually buses that have intelligence programmed into them so they can visualize for their passengers where they are in relation to other buses, who's late, who's coming, the whole network as an emergent network rather than a top-down centralized network. Um, and this example is a pill box that has a brain in it. So it communicates to you when you have to take your pills, and it also sends pulses, information to your doctor and to your pharmacy when you need a refill, which I just think is lovely and helpful. And that's one hour and three minutes. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know that um, we all see many possibilities in your lecture for what is possible in the future. On, our focus has been on education and learning, but there's so many things happening in the world that we can't even imagine what the future is going to be like especially for people that are relying on that information. So thank you very much. It's really a fabulous job. And it's time for maybe some open questions. And um, if you would come up here, and if you notice the red mark on the floor, if you could uh, ask your question from here. If you want to come up, there's one piece of tape for each foot. So Not intimidating at all. <laughs> just because of the, the video streaming and individuals in the audience here as well will be able to see you. And then there's a microphone up here as well if you'd like to speak your question. Uh, you're welcome to do so. 
we have fabulous interpreters to help facilitate communication. All right. <laughs> it's really not a question. I want to make a comment. <laughs> I just said there was two. Tell started. him that I've had to stand here for an hour. He can come for a comment. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> yes, I'm going to go see. <laughs> no, very good presentation. Oh, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Um, I remember there was uh, the game Angry Birds, and I think this might have been in Spain where there was a computer screen where people would come up to it, and you know the game Angry Birds. Have you ever played it? Yeah? Did you get all Have stars? Have I lived? <laughs> <laughs> yes. OK. Yes, everyone has to play this game. So yes. anyway, though, what they did was um, they, would, they would flip it on the screen, and then they would see in physical space where um, it would really interact with real life, and they would see the bird jump and oh. explode or whatever. Have you ever seen this? Anybody ever seen this, Angry Birds? Do you know what I'm talking about? So in Spain, they developed this interactive um, you know, game very, very worthwhile. They have a physical space and virtual space interacting with each other. Um, have you seen this? Have you seen no, this? No, I haven't seen it, but it sounds exciting. I recommend it. Highly recommend Thank it. Thank you. Uh, you could YouTube Angry Birds in real life, and okay. you'll see people there. Uh, really neat. Um, that may good. be an idea for a future project. Yeah, that as sounds well. great. Thank you for sharing. wanted to make more of a kind of an announcement because you're I wanted to make a, a kind of an announcement because your visit is incredibly well timed are, are you are you in town for tonight. did you oh just for tonight okay because this week is digital capital week and all around the city there are all sorts of events happening including uh, we just in DC opened um, the, the Fab Lab, which has 3D printers okay. and, um, and laser cutters, and it's a community center where you can do 3D printing. And uh, on Friday at Artmosphere in, in Virginia, there is going to be a lecture on the Internet of Things. Oh, perfect. Uh, so, I mean, all of the stuff you're talking about, it's, it's going on right now in the city all over the place. So I just wanted to get that out there. So... Thank you. Is he trying to get out of standing up? I wanted to ask a question about the, from the previous speaker. Uh, related to 3D printers, I'm wondering if it can be a specific kind of program Maya or um, with the 3D printers, what kind of software do, you, do does it use? Is it Maya? It. The one that, um, this is the announcement about the place with the 3D printers. I'm very curious about that. So I'm going to ask you more about that. Uh. I see, okay. It's almost all 3D software. Um, there's many different kinds you can use with this. Um, and there's one that can tie it all in together. So um, there's multiple possibilities. Thank you very much. I enjoyed your presentation. Uh, one part in the beginning when you mentioned uh, about the storytelling, the conversation that's more interactive, and it talks about the intent and what that brings and sort of reading that um, intelligence. So now with storytelling, uh, it could be done within a play. 
Um, and so how would you, uh, so it could be a story in a story. So the play becomes, um, or the technology makes it more interactive because you're responding to individuals in the play. And within that play, you can also become interactive that they would respond to the back to the audience. Uh, is there an example that you can think of where you've integrated that within theater or storytelling or anything like that? I haven't done it in, uh, I haven't done it, but there is an amazing project by um, Art Plus Com, that's A-O-T plus, the plus sign, and C-O-M, and it, it was an opera in Munich. If you just go on their website, you'll see it. It's an opera in Munich, and all the uh, all the performers were wearing LED covered costumes and the graphics that were generated on their costumes was created in real time and it was driven by their movement and their relationship to the protagonist of the play. So it didn't have what you were saying which is audience participation but I wonder whether philosophically in a play, actors would want that or not. I mean, I think that's a different conversation, which is not, can we do it? Yes, we can. But at what points do you want to enable what conversations? I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. It's been great. Your comments now are making me think about the research that you've done in your work and designing a new environment. I'm wondering if you have any work that takes a look at uh, taking a look at tools in terms of how uh, people attached to their environment and just research that you've done with tools to facilitate that interaction. Uh, do you mean a little bit like the example I showed at the beginning with wayfinding? This one? Oh. This is going to be hard. Let me just go backwards. It was the suit for the Blind. Oh, I had oh, a lot of slides. Yeah, no, that's okay. It's okay. Okay. No, I. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, yeah, I mean. I didn't mean. To, no, I no, wasn't no. Here in the very beginning. That's why I missed yeah. the beginning. No, no, no. And um, I. To me, that's a really interesting world, that hasn't been fully tapped into, and actually, most of the research that I've done on wearable computing has been really um, frivolous, in my opinion. It's like designers that make really cool dresses that glow, which to me is pretty but not interesting. But there's more work to be done, which for me, that's just exciting. That's the world we haven't done yet. Oh. Most of what you've shown so far addresses visual, possibly auditory stimuli, but what about tactile stuff? Any considerations for adding that in? It might be another layer of challenge? Yeah, um, tactile is really interesting. Here's the trick. I, we, I took Delia about natural communication. So there's either the interface that displays the technology or the machines with which we communicate with it. If you want to combine them, then right now, there's not too much we can do with altering the surface of a media delivery system. Do you see what I'm saying? I'll, let's take a physical example. If, let's take this image right here. If we wanted to add the tactile, we couldn't change the material 
of the media. So we'd have to put it somewhere else. But now you're separating from that thing that drives it, the story from that thing that drives it. I think that's more of a technology thing that will come. So people are developing soft uh, screens that will enable us to change it, but definitely interesting. Um, and so, and not only the, the, the feel of it, but not only the look and feel of it, but how it makes me feel, like that interaction goes both ways. Yeah. You know, hot, cold, uh, you know, so the temperatures and not, um, not so much, I'm, I'm looking for it to reach out to me as well and touch me in a physical way I as see. well. Yes. Do you know, we try to talk to our clients a lot about everything from sound to scent to anything you can imagine. But it's very hard for people today to wrap their heads around it. So I think we'll get that, but absolutely we want to. Um, there's a Yes, thank you, absolutely. <laughs> What's he saying? Are you saying that the other gloves that have sensors on them and stuff? Yeah, but with Connect, you don't even need gloves. With Microsoft Connect, you don't even need gloves. Do you know this? Microsoft Connect? K I N E C T. Interesting presentation. Um, in relation to technology, there was one slide about a um, museum uh, where a person was standing in front of them for, uh, in front of this display for a long moment, and there was a, a picture in a, a wheelchair, a person in a wheelchair. Um, so, curious about how long it took to develop that display, and what system did you use technically? Oh, uh, to have that moving sensor, the moving response, so it senses the person's movements. It's super easy and not expensive. It's a simple motion sensor that detects activity in front of it, and so what we do is we build the sensor into the fixture. So you can't see it, but it can see you. And what it does is it will measure, once you come into its field of vision, it will measure how long you're still for. And then based on a parameter that we define, if you linger for more than eight seconds, I think it was programmed, then it'll trigger additional content. It sounds complicated, it's not really. Does that answer the question? Can it identify different individuals? There are platforms that can. And I've seen an installation that Adidas did that claims to even recognize gender. That, to me, is a scary world. And I, I'm not comfortable going there. Um, so we just kept it at, is there human activity, yes or no, without getting creepy. This is not, uh, this is more of a comment than a question. But I do want to say uh, from the presentation today, it's very enlightening and even in some ways uh, overwhelming feeling of validation because of the work that we've been doing related to deaf space, looking at how deaf people navigate through space and, and negotiate that. So the examples that you've given today about how we interact with our environment and the space around us as individuals really is right on. Um, I, just one story, um, a student, um, the student right here, was doing a project and we were talking about um, and looking into 
the idea of in the evening uh, and how deaf people navigate and how they interact in, in you know, the world. So let's say it's the evening and sort of the winter time in DC and there's trees that align the street. And as I'm walking, I'm, um, and uh, as a light, uh, as a deaf person that cannot hear for security in the evening, you wanna be closer to the light posts. Mm. So if um, a light is behind me and my shadow is in front of me, that shadow is long, and uh, that means that I can look and see if someone is behind me from the cast of the shadow. And then once I come up on the next light pole, my shadow becomes closer and closer until I hit the next. And then so in that point, I walk a little bit faster because I wanna make sure that I'm not having somebody you know, behind me. So that's um, the experience of how we interact with a visual space around mm. us. So I'm wondering, um, with the design that you have done, have you seen, uh, from, the, from what I've just described, can, do you see anything or have you came upon anything that could help with that kind of interaction of deaf people walking at night in the street and being able to um, interact, uh, have knowledge of what's around you? Well, I'd want to do some, my homework on this. But my sense is the same senses that we used in La Plaza could potentially walk because all they need to do is detect activity and a certain type of activity within a distance, of what would be a safe distance for you. I mean, that's it's super interesting. One of the things that's so exciting for me about being here and we were talking about this earlier, is that today, this is not my normal world, and today has really made me think of the world in a different way, and um, perceive the world in a different way. And I think, I, w I wanna think about what you owe me and get back to you, but I also think that there's a kind of responsibility um, of the deaf community to share with us the things that you know about space because the experience you just described to me is entirely fascinating. I never even think about street lights. So on two levels, I think it's possible and I think that there's a larger story here to convey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Really great presentation. You've given us so much food for thought. I want to thank everyone for coming. Oh, uh, please fill out your evaluations. Um, I want to give it's my email. Very in helpful. Case they and the speaker is wanting to say something about her email address. Yeah, I just want to give you my email because if you ever have a thought or an idea, I'd love to hear from you. It's, uh, and we'll post it as well. Oh, okay, perfect. So should I give it or not? Good question. Okay, it's, oh, you want me to type it? I can do that. Can I do that, actually? No, oh, okay, we'll you'll, you'll type it. It's, uh, I should have written it, but I didn't. It's T for Tommy, A-L-I, at Apolog Studio, that's A-P-O, L O G U E. I'm killing someone here. <laughs> dot com. Okay. No. No. Anyway, just. I'll do it again. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay. T for Tommy, A for Apple, L for love, I at Apolog, A for Apple, P for Peter, O, L for love, O, G for God, U, E, studio.com.
yes, without the spaces. <laughs> completes our uh, presentation. Have a pleasant evening. See you next time. This has been a production of Gallaudet University.